Would you stand with us this morning and worship the King? He's worthy. Come on, put your hands together. Let's praise Him, church. God of mercy. Square Church, man, a lot of new things are happening, a lot of um, yeah, fresh air in, in the air, right, since this rain. Praise God, right, man. Um, but above all, man, it's just so cool that we can all come in here together, collectively, worship our God who loves us dearly, more than we can fathom. And so let's just bless him today in our praise and our worship. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name.
time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing in the evening. Come. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship.
spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. By your spirit
My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest phrase. sing Jesus we lift it all up to you this morning because you are worthy you are higher but yet even though you are higher you came down to be with us you came down here to reside with us your presence is always with us Lord thank you God we love you for that and I pray that our hearts as we uh, as we listen to the message this morning or if we just reminisce on something that we remembered that we sang this week, or if it was some kind of verse that we opened up in your word, Lord, whatever is on our heart, I pray that it would help soften to have compassion for others around us. 
Lord, so that we can give your love that you have freely given to us to them. And so that we can invite more people into your kingdom. Because that's what it's all about, is to have a relationship with you, to have knowledge and love surrounding us with your name all the time. Amen. Well, guys, uh, again, it's so awesome to see you here. So awesome to worship with you all. It's such a privilege. Uh, this morning, just turn to one another, give each other a high five, give each other a hug. It's awesome to see you this morning. You're awesome. Either way. Okay. I'll stand behind you because, you know, I'd like to still see me. <laughs> well, then I don't want to stand in front of Kate. I'll stand right here. I'll stand right here. That sounds good. Boy. Is good morning. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here this morning. It's going to be such a, I mean, we're starting a new series, This Is Us, and I want to introduce who we are, because <laughs> this is us right here, this is us. Um, I want to introduce to you our new interns, because they're such an intricate part of who we are, and they're, you know, they're going to be everywhere you are, and uh, it's just always exciting to 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 have them come along and um, and how much you love and support them and how much they want to love and support you too. So let me introduce to introduce you to them. This is Kaylee and yeah and Jacob Nathan <laughs> Billy Courtney <laughs> And Jesse, yeah. So thank you, thank you. So Pastor Dave, are you ready? All right, thanks, thanks, guys. Hey, they're going to Africa in February, and they're selling smoothies. You're awesome. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, welcome everyone. Uh, just so glad you're here. There are welcome cards in the pockets there, and if you're new with us, we'd really like to know a little bit about you. If you'd fill one of those out, drop it in the giving basket uh, when it goes uh, by, and uh, if you take it to the uh, cafe, you get a free cup of coffee or some kind of drink, and uh, we just want you to feel welcome. Just let us know uh, how we can serve you. Um, this is a great time to prepare your giving, and as we give... It occurs to me that it's at the very core of our being that we want to make a difference. We want to do something. We want to leave a track uh, behind us. And even I see in Ephesians 2.10 where it says that we're uh, God's uh, workmanship, uh, masterpiece. Uh, we're his creation in Christ Jesus to do good works, to do good things, uh, which God before ordained that we would do. That's at the very core of our being, we were created to do things. And I think below that, inside of that, we're here to make a difference, and part of that is in our giving. And so we give to make a difference here and in our community and internationally. And so we give, and, and we know what we're doing. We want to make a difference. God, as we give, we give knowing that you're at work 
And we just ask that you would multiply the impact because we want to make a difference. We have to make a difference. We have to bring change in our world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks to the ushers. Thank you. Well, there's several things I, I want to let you know about or, or remind you of. Uh, first, Canby Cares is now only three weeks away. Can, yeah, Canby Cares is not just some small thing in a corner for others to take care of. It's for all of us to engage our community. Um, it's a, a chance for us to partner with medical and uh, social services, dental, different things, different organizations. And it's here on our campus, and we're becoming known as a place that cares uh, far more than just kind of an insider kind of place for Christians. And I, I love that. I, I love that a lot. You can uh, volunteer. Uh, in fact, everybody just plan on it. Uh, we can volunteer uh, in the lobby. Uh, there's a table there as part of the expo. You can talk directly to the director, Joy, about it, and you can also uh, register online. Uh, there are things that you can do. Hospitality, you can work with the uh, children in the children's area. Um, interpretation, of course, there's setup, takedown. I'll be there. My group will be there, and we're just looking forward to making uh, a difference. So be sure and sign up. Uh, another thing, that's three weeks away, then this coming Sunday, baby dedications. So you can sign up at the information desk uh, in the lobby, and you can also sign up online. That, that is, that's just going to be fun. And so just, yeah, just get that taken care of. That's just going to be great. Then the third thing, this is our last su Sunday, our last part of the expo this morning. You can see the balloons, but there's tables uh, in the lobby and in the patio with uh, representatives of some of our small groups to talk to you about how to find a group that fits you. You'll also uh, note that you were given a, a pamphlet, brochure. As you came in, it's called Next, because everybody has a next step on their journey with Jesus. And this new brochure replaces the ones we used to have, and it points people to the website, but it does so in a way that also informs and, and just helps people take that next step. So after the service, there'll be smoothies uh, outside, then in the lobby, there'll be people to talk with, and then also don't miss the patio where there are still more groups, and you can sign up for information, or you can uh, make a commitment, you can talk to people, it's just, it's just, it's just a great opportunity. Um, this morning, Pastor Ron launches This Is Us, We Love You. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, good morning. It is, uh, it is so good to see you this morning. I'm going to do something with all of us today. Would you do this? I know you're a little comfortable, but go ahead and stand up just for a moment. We're going to start off our time together. I think it's appropriate we start a series, This Is Us, Jesus Is Enough, uh, by joining hands. Now, I'm going to ask you to join hands with the people next to you, whether you like them or not. You join hands with them. And what we need to do today, I, 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 really, I really feel like we want to do this today together, and that is to pray for those that are in the pathway of Irma, Irma and then the Harvey victims, uh, Hurricane Harvey victims. And one of the things we want to do is be very practical about this. So you can give to World Vision. That's what we're asking everyone to give to. But we also have one other thing that you can do. Uh, Pastor Chaplain Bill Roberts is standing in the back. Bill and I made a trip to Katrina several years ago. And if you want to go and actually be on site in Texas, in Houston, contact Bill. What they need now is people just to go through and kind of muck out the houses and uh, help them get back to where they were before, help them get restored. And so, Bill, you're back there, and you can meet him in the lobby. So let's pray together. Father, we join our hands and our hearts today for what you are wanting to accomplish in all of our lives. But right now, we just pray for the, those that are in the pathway of Irma, those that are devastated, have been devastated by Hurricane Harvey. Lord, our hearts go out to them. We pray for family and friends that are represented here in this room, that you would keep them, that you would bring safety, that you, Lord Jesus, would intervene. And as we've prayed before, Lord, you can send that divine assistance and that, that divine help that we cannot. And so we engage that through the power of prayer, 
And we ask in Jesus' name that you would do a good work. Uh, Cover them today, Lord Jesus. Keep our nation. In Jesus' name we pray. And we say together, amen, amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. Would you open your Bibles with me today to the Gospel of Mark chapter 5? We're going to look at Mark chapter 5 verses 1 through 20. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles around this building. They're blue. Go ahead and take one. They're yours. If you really don't have a Bible, we want to give that to you as a gift. And while you're looking and uh, looking for Mark chapter 5, let me just say how much, uh, how much Annette and I really do uh, appreciate you. Uh, we're... we're we're so blessed to be in this kind of community, a community with you. We missed you when we were gone. Uh, you are amazing people. And one of the things that you have done and you'll continue to do, and I've seen it in your lives, is you're so incredibly generous. And I want to say this. It's your generosity that really makes a way for Jesus to literally change lives. It's through our generosity with what we have and who we are that makes a difference in the world that we live in. So I want to say this to all of you. Thank you. Really, thank you, thank you, thank you. You are amazing. So now if you found Mark chapter 5, I want you to go back just a few verses to Mark chapter 4. So if you're in the vicinity of 5, you will find 4. And look at verses 35 through 41. This is the story before the story. And there's always a story before the story. And I want you to listen to what this account gives us about what Jesus was up to. It begins in Mark chapter 4, verse 35. It says, That day when evening came... He said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drowned? And he got up rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. And then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Who in the world is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? That's an amazing story that leads really into our story. I want you to notice verse 35 where it says, and Jesus says, let us go to the other side. How many know that's a setup? That is actually a divine setup. When Jesus tells us that we're going to the other side, he has something specific in mind, and it usually is not a pleasure cruise. It's usually not something that's going to be really comfortable for us. When he says, let's go to the other side, we can be sure that he's going to teach us something that we didn't know before. That he wants to talk to us and teach us lessons that we had not learned before. And you might think that just because Jesus is sleeping, that he doesn't care, or he's not paying attention, and that's not true, it's the furthest thing from the truth. Jesus cares very much for our well-being. Not so much for our comfort but really for our well-being. So when Jesus says, let us go to the other side, there are a few things that you can count on. The first thing that you can count on is trouble. Just say that, trouble, just so you get used to saying. The first thing that we can count on is trouble. You will face a storm, and Jesus always has a purpose for that storm. You know what storms do in our lives, what they do in my life, is storms expose our fears and our faith. And if you read through Scripture, really, through Genesis to Revelation, what you find out is there's always a correlation between the two. More fear, less faith. More faith, less fear. I mean, listen to what Jesus said to the disciples in verse 40. He said, he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? There's the fear. Do you still have no faith? There's the faith. So in your journey, in the storm that you might be in right now, Know that what Jesus is up to in this storm is he's exposing things in our life that have to do with fear and faith. And maybe you want to take a little inventory. (laughs) Take a few notes on the fear levels you have. How much do you really believe and trust in Jesus during this time? So here's something else that happens in the storm. Jesus expands what we thought we knew about him. Boy, write that one down. Jesus expands what we thought we knew about him. Look at verse 41. It says, they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? 
Who in the world is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Wow. Who is this? Right when you think you know him, he blows it up. Right when you think you've got a handle on him, you have him in a box, he blows it up. His disciples knew him as a great teacher, as a healer, as a leader, but he is much more than they imagined. Jesus is much more than any of us can ever, ever imagine. And it isn't interesting here that when Jesus goes beyond how we know him, it terrifies us. That when he stretches our boundaries, when he breaks our our images of what we might think we have in Jesus, the handle we might have on Jesus, we are terrified. It says here that the wind and the waves obey him. He's the creator and he has power over creation. Didn't know that about him. I mean, that's what the disciples are thinking. Wow, I only knew him like this, but now he has dominion over creation, meaning he's the creator. Had no idea. Had no idea that this is really who he is. So whatever it is you think you know about Jesus, remember this. Remember he's more. He is much more. That whatever you're journeying through, whatever you're being exposed to in life right now, Jesus is more. He's much more. So what is Jesus showing you right now about himself that you didn't know before? Maybe you're going through a time and and you didn't know certain things about Jesus and he's showing up and he's, He's teaching you about who he really is and how much deeper that relationship goes, how much he desires for that relationship to grow. That's what he's doing. He's doing that here with the disciples. Now that leads us to Mark chapter 5. And I think to really get the most out of of this passage, there's a mindset that I'm asking you to take on. So do this with me if you would for a moment. Here it is. There are times that we read the Gospels and we put ourselves in the story as the hero. And this is probably true the more we grow in Jesus. It's probably true the more mature we are, the longer we've been around. But we put ourselves in the story as the good guy, the good gal. We don't usually see ourselves as the prostitute or the tax collector or the Pharisee. Certainly not a demoniac. This offends our our sense of of self-respect and dignity. Put this aside just for a moment, if you would. I want you to do this. Just put that aside And ask yourself this question, is there something about this man's life that relates to me? Is my story in this story? Is there something here that will cause me to grow deeper in my relationship with Jesus Christ when I become vulnerable and transparent and honest with myself in this account, in this gospel? In Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, it says this, And then they came to the other side, to the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken into pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. In verse 4, it says, neither could anyone tame him, that he was an untamed man. The word untamed means unmanageable, uncontrollable, unbroken. Someone who lacks surrender. Untamed can be something I do, and when I do it, I can't believe I did it. I mean, it's that compulsive side of who we are. For some, it may be an addiction. For some, it may be outbursts of anger or overspending. Whatever that might be, you do it, you can't believe you did it. That, that, that can be something in our lives, something in our spirit that is untamed. And it's the, these untamed actions that have isolated me from others that, that lead me to feelings of despair. Maybe you've, you've been there before. So here's the good news. It's for the untamed that Jesus brings freedom. That's the good news. So I want everyone in the room just to remember this. He comes into our despair and isolation and he brings resurrected life. So what did Jesus do here? Jesus went through the untamed storm to get to this untamed man just like me. That there's nothing that keeps Jesus back from getting to you, from getting to me. 
So how far will Jesus go? Well, here he comes through and goes to the other side. Geographic and cultural barriers are broken. Jesus enters a foreign land, not Jewish-friendly territory. You have to keep this in mind. So why did Jesus go to a place that was racially and culturally different than his own? Well, I'm going to give you the short answer. The short answer is simple. His mercy has no bounds. It has no barriers. When Jesus went to the other side, his disciples not only discovered that he was the creator who had dominion over creation, they also discover that the love of Jesus has no racial barriers. That the love of Jesus doesn't keep people back in culture. The gospel is not exclusive to any culture, to any race. And this is a big, big deal, especially in the day that we live. This is huge. Jesus says later in Matthew 28 and 19, he says, go and make disciples of all nations. And if you look that up and read that in the original, the word nation is the, in the original language is the word ethnos, meaning all people, every culture, every ethnicity. So listen to what the Apostle Paul tells us about being disciples of Jesus and how we're to view others. And he does so in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. By the way, that's our theme verse for this church. And this is what it says, beginning at verse 14. It says, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for us and for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Another translation might say according to the flesh. Though we once regarded Christ in that way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Not counting people's sins against them. And he's committed to us, remember this, the message of reconciliation. Get that right there. He has committed to you and to me, Christ followers, the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God. Verse 14 says here, the love of Christ compels us. Compels us to do what? Well, it compels us to do a few things. One is this, no longer live for ourselves. (laughs) When Jesus comes in as Christ's followers, it's not about us anymore. It's not about our plan anymore. It really is all about God's agenda. It's about the Great Commission and what he's called you to do and how he's asked you to engage your passions, your gifting in reaching others for Christ. It's not about us anymore. So Paul says, hey, forget what you used to know because the love of Christ does something in us and lets us know it's not about us anymore. The second thing is, it's no longer, and we no longer regard others according to the flesh. That's what verse 16 says. So when I think about according to the flesh and how I judge others according to the flesh, there are a few things that come to mind. How I might judge others just by what I see, first glance. One of those things is I might judge others according to their education whether they have more or less education. That's kind of what we do. That's how we judge people. Another is I might judge others according to their economy, whether they're rich or poor or middle class, whether they can help me or not financially. That might be how I judge according to economy. Here's another one. I judge others according to to gender, male and, 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 and female. Uh, my granddaughter, she, she's just great. She's really a businesswoman. I mean, she just really goes after it. In fact, they just started a company the other day, if you're interested and you want to invest. There's a company that she started called Sweller. It's uh, between Swore and Deller, and it's, they sell grapes. Not for wine, but they sell grapes. And so they got this enterprise going on, and she talks to me about how this enterprise is really going to help us and how much money she's going to make. But here's what often happens. What often happens is when a young woman does that, she's called bossy. When a young boy does that, he's called the boss. So what am I doing there? I'm judging others according to their gender. I happen to be married to a strong 
leader who's very feminine. And I love that. I love her leadership. I love her strength. But Paul says here we no longer judge according to the flesh. We have a different perspective, a different view of the people around us. Here's another way that I'll judge people. I'll judge them according to ethnicity, ethnicity, the color of their skin, the culture they're part of, the language they might speak. And then the third thing is I'm called to be a minister of reconciliation because we are now ambassadors of Christ. That's the ministry that we've been given, that we've been entrusted with, that now I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ. There's no greater calling. That whatever business you're in, whatever venture you have, whatever position or station you are in life, what trumps all of that is that I am now an ambassador for Jesus Christ. That's my high calling. That's what I've been called to. The old way of thinking is gone. The new way has come. We no longer represent the flesh. We no longer represent ourselves. We represent the king and his kingdom. Amen. That's who you represent. That's who I represent. Now that I'm a new creation in Christ and an ambassador for Christ, listen to this, and I want, you to, I want you to hear this today. It's important we understand this. I would violate my call and the great than myself with hate, bigotry, or racism. Or where I, I use my privilege, be it education, economy, race, for only personal gain and not for the good of others in the name of Jesus. And according to scripture, it would be hypocritical of me to call out some sin and then pull back when it comes to calling racism a sin. And I want to say this clearly, racism is a sin. And the groups like KKK and the neo-Nazis who perpetuate this sin are evil, they're demonically inspired. If you study their origins, their origins are from the occult. You have to be aware of that. You have to know that and understand it. And as an ambassador for Jesus, here's my goal. And maybe this can be yours as well. That everyone I encounter experiences the love, the grace, and the hospitality of Jesus Christ. I am not superior to any I am a servant of all. Can you say amen to that? As an ambassador of Jesus Christ, this is what I'm called to. This is who I am. So next time you are challenged to cross over racial or cultural boundaries, I want you to ask yourself two questions. And here are the questions. Number one, where is the gospel not supposed to go? Just ask yourself that. And secondly this, and who is the love of Jesus limited to? The answer, nowhere, nobody. That's the answer. And I want you to remember this. Hold this close to your heart. Jesus crossed over for you. The Bible says that he came from heaven to earth. That's a big crossing. That he crossed over for me. That he crossed over for the world that he died for. His mercy is boundless. So given the environment that we live in today, understanding scripture and knowing that I'm an ambassador of Jesus Christ, how do I respond to this? Because I think that's what people are really wanting to know. Questions they're asking, how do I respond? Well, number one, and most importantly, pray. And I'm saying this, pray with vigor. And I'm not just, it's just not a, it's, it's just not a prayer around the dinner table. Those are great prayers. But this is not a wrestle between flesh and blood. This is a wrestle between powers and principalities. And so the first thing we do is we engage in prayer. And we say, Lord, there's something here that's confronting us that's of spiritual nature and has spiritual power to it. And I want to confront that in the name of Jesus with the power of the gospel. And I want to see it dispelled wherever I go. In Jesus' name. So pray. Secondly, do this. Get involved. Get involved. Cross over. The can-be sinner, bridging cultures, the can-be cares. There are so many places that we can get involved and we can serve. 
Chaplain Bill is going to be taking a team down to Houston area. There's another way. If you're so inclined to get involved, we have ways to get involved. And then the third thing, and I want you to hear this carefully, is to teach and model the love of Jesus Christ. Because this is what I know about racism. It's usually generational. It's usually passed down in families. And I'm so thankful, and I want to tell you this, I'm so thankful that I had a father that broke the generational curse of racism in my family. Because all my family hail primarily, and it isn't exclusive to the South, but that's where they came from. And my dad stood up against that spirit, and he modeled for his children and his children's children in embracing of all cultures and of all people in Jesus' name. So parents, stand up. Model the love of Jesus. Have conversations that our kids desperately need to have today. Can you say amen to that? Amen. amen. Now look at verses 6 through 8. And this is where Jesus intersects my story. It says, when he saw Jesus from a distance, I love this, he ran and he fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me? Jesus, son of the most high God, in God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. I love this. A man who seems to be beyond repair runs to Jesus and he worships him. Other translation says, tells us that he just literally fell on his knees and he worshiped Jesus Christ. This man has enough of what God has created in him to be that he knows Jesus is freedom. Because sometimes when, we, when we're taken over by these untamed things in our lives, we're wondering, is there enough of me that can really come to Jesus? I'm going to tell you this, absolutely. And even the people you pray for that you think are way past repair, there's something that is in them. God has created them. He's wired them to have purpose. He's wired them to worship the creator, Jesus Christ. Keep praying. Keep inviting Because there's the power of Jesus that's at work in all of this. And that's what I love. Listen, demons run from Jesus, not to Jesus. Get that in your mind. This man runs to Jesus. He recognizes that Jesus is his only hope. Jesus isn't an option. Because oftentimes that's what we think. Well, I've got option A, B, and C. Jesus is the only option. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life. You know, it's amazing what our feet will do when our hearts are desperate enough for Jesus. It's amazing. So watch what happens next. Jesus changes this man's identity. In verses 9 through 17, it says, Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. And he gave them permission. And the impure spirits came out and they went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and they were drowned. Now that's a sight right there. That's, That's a sight. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and then they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. And then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. You're too much for us. We can't handle you. (laughs) This isn't anything we've ever seen happen before. This scares us to death. But what's the result of this? It's a man who was once untamed, now in his right mind, serving Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He changes his identity. Look at verse 9. What verse 9 says there, this is interesting. After Jesus cast out the demons, he asked him, what is your name? The man answers, Legion. 
And the reason I believe he answers that way is that's all he knew. That's what he believed about himself. That's what he was told by others who he was. We experience some similar things, old names and labels, others that, that, that others give us. They're just really hard to shake, aren't they? Some of us still live under those old names. I still got that little pain when you hear it. My name is Shorty. My name is Weak. My name is Stupid. All names given to me by others. So um, uh, how many uh, like your picture on your driver's license? Would you like that? Yeah, some of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a rhetorical question almost. Um, most of us don't like our picture. Uh, yeah, when, when we get our picture on our driver's license, it's like, how did, I, how, did, how did I come up with that? How did they get that? Oh, I, I just had one bad day, and guess who provoked that bad day? It was the DMV, because I've been here for four hours, and that's what my picture looks like after I've been at the DMV for four hours. Nobody likes those pictures, and you look at that picture, and you think, oh, great, I'm stuck with that for eight or ten years. I mean, every time I pull it out, here it is, it's my identity. That's what I look like in the DMV. Yeah, that, that's the identi- that's, that, that's an identity that we see from our driver's license. But let me say this to you. That's not the identity Jesus gives us. Jesus changes our identity. The old is gone. The new has come. I love what verse 15 says here. It says, and when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. And he was sitting there. He was dressed Something they hadn't seen in a long time. And he was in his right mind. Jesus changed his name from Legion to Beloved. And there are names that we still, like I said earlier, we live under. You'll see on your outline, you have a couple places where there are blanks there. It says, my name was, I want to change that word, my name is, change it to my name was, blank, my name is, blank. Because I want you to see something that, that Isaiah 62 says. It says, for Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet. Tell her vindication shines out like the dawn. Her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your vindication. And all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name. That the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be crowned with splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will they call you deserted or isolated or stupid. No longer will that be your name. Your name and the land that you live in will no longer be called desolate, but you will be called Hephzibah, which means my delight. And your land will be called Beulah, which means set apart. For great purpose, for the Lord will take delight in you, and your land will be married. As a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. Now I want you to do something very personal. I want you to take that outline and maybe write in what your name used to be, but oftentimes you still live under that. And then in the second line, my name is chosen, beloved, son, daughter of the king. Because that's our reality. Because we've been reconciled by Christ through Jesus, by God through Jesus Christ, I now have a new identity. And now with a new identity, what happens is Jesus gives me a new story, a new testimony. I love what it says in Mark chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. It says, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but he said to him, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And so the man went away and he began to tell in the Decapolis, that's the 10 cities, uh, Gentile cities in that region, how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Here's the new narrative. 
This is what people were saying about him after he had this encounter with Jesus. And Jesus changes his identity. What are they saying now? They're saying, you know the guy that, that lived in the tombs? His name was Legion? You know that guy? <laughs> he had this encounter with Jesus Christ, and he's not the same. He had this encounter with Jesus Christ, and he's different. He went from being untamed to being redeemed. He went from being chained to being set free. He went from living in the tombs with the dead to be a man about the gospel. Wow. That's what Jesus can do. This man became, listen, this man became the first missionary to the Gentiles. How many have gone to Bible college and you've heard a few things? You've heard this. Peter was the first missionary to the Gentiles. Or Paul might have been the first missionary to the Gentiles. This is the first missionary to the Gentiles. Isn't this amazing? What does he do? He goes to the Gentile nations around him. And he tells them of what Jesus has done for him and the mercy that God has had on him. So what is your story? What is your narrative? What do you tell people? Listen, sometimes we make it so complicated. We think, oh my goodness, what am I going to tell them? I don't know a lot of theology. I really haven't been to Bible college. I don't know what to tell them. Tell them your story. Tell them what God has done for you. Tell them about the mercy that Jesus has shown you. That's what you tell them. And that changes the places you go to. That, that changes the cultures that you're part of. That's exactly what this man did. I love God when he does this in amazing ways. That he takes somebody who was untamed and he changes their life and they become a missionary for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know he's done that for me. And I know he's done that for many of you. That he's changed your narrative. He's changed your story. I want to introduce to you one of my friends. Kevin Logan, come on up here. Kevin, let Kevin know you love him. Even though you don't know him, you might not know him. Let him know that. Kevin is a, is a, is a good friend. And we get to hang out. And I love his narrative. I love his story. I love how Jesus changed you. And uh, we were talking about this story, and he goes, yeah, I, I know what it was like to be that untamed man. I know what that was like. And so tell us a little bit about your story. Hey, guys, my name's Kevin, and I'm an addict. Hey, Kevin. Wow. Uh, I just want to take all this in. You guys <laughs> mean a lot to me. Uh, so uh, what would they call me? They called me weak. They called me worthless. Mm. What I found out is that I have this disease of addiction, and uh, it had a great power over me. No matter how strong I thought I was, no matter what, what I asked for, I couldn't stop. I just could not stop. In our, what I know about the disease of addiction is that we can be prayed over, we can be jailed, we can be beaten, we can be locked up, just like, just like the demoniac. Mm -hmm. And nothing's, nothing is going to stop us until we're ready to stop, until we're ready to go to Jesus and ask for help. Mm -hmm. Because the power of the disease of addiction and alcohol... See, if, if drugs and alcohol were the problem, then detox would be the answer. Just mm -hmm. send us a detox. Woo, thank God that's over. But the problem is, is that we have this disease from which there's no known cure. But if, in fact, we can go to Jesus and ask for help, we get help. Mm -hmm. We get help every time. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say this. For a long time, I was looking for a relationship with Jesus. I take care of my 88-year-old mom, and, and uh, when we moved here to Canby, we started shopping for churches and looking for a place to go and uh, and I love Jesus but some of his people are just <laughs> they're a little judgmental and I was afraid I was afraid because this is who I am and I didn't know if you guys would accept me I still don't and I get afraid I speak all over the country uh, to Narcotics Anonymous meetings but coming here and speaking to you guys, I'm a little afraid <laughs> because this is who I am, mm -hmm. and I think you may judge me. Mm -hmm. But here's the deal. 
when we came to this church, you guys opened your arms. You loved me and my family up. And I'm going to tell you, you know how Jesus said to the demoniac, go to your people, go to your family and tell them, that's what I'm doing. You are my family. I have adopted every single one of you. And I hope you'll adopt me. <laughs> you guys have created a disciple of Jesus in me, and that's what I'm doing in my life. Mm -hmm. So when you leave, and my goal here at Canby Four Square Church is to hug each and every one. I know it's uncomfortable. <laughs> Some of the people I walk up to hug kind of go, ooh, that's weird. But I'm going to hug each one of you. That's my goal here at this church, to make sure that you guys get a loving hug. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't get a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm here to tell you guys, this thing called Narcotics Anonymous, this thing that we're doing here, the things that you guys have opened us up, that money that you give and created that community room, we had 48 people in there Friday night mm. finding recovery. Find in recovery from the disease of addiction. And I'm going to tell you this. There are, there are miracles that are happening at this place. Miracles. People are walking in there broken. Broken. And feeling the need for Jesus in their life and afraid that they're going to be judged. And we are welcoming them here. They are coming and showing up here in our fellowship and in our church. And you guys have just opened your hearts to them. And for that, I love you all, and I want to thank you for what you've done for me. My name now is Legion, and I am a disciple of Christ. <laughs> and you guys have created that in me, so thank you. <laughs> thank you, man. I love you. Love you too. Thanks, brother. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. And he will hug you, so just uh, be sure. Be sure of that. He changes our identity. He gives us a new story. And I'm so thankful for that. I'm so grateful that he's done that for you. He's done that for me. I want to do this right now. Would you just bow your head for a moment and close your eyes? And if uh, you're here today and there's something about the stories that you've heard, there's something about the scripture that you've heard today, the Bible story that you hear today that has just if in influenced your heart. And you don't know Jesus. You haven't taken that step to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Just like this demoniac did, he ran, he saw Jesus. He knew that this was the King of Kings. He knew that that's where he needed to go and surrender. Today, you're invited to do the same. You're invited to put aside the untamed life and, and, and live a life for Jesus Christ. He does that for us. But it takes that first step of surrender. It takes that first step of saying, Lord, I come to you, I surrender, I, I worship you. And if you're here with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, if you want to do that, if you want to surrender to Jesus, just lift your hand. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you, but it's got to start somewhere. And typically, this is a great place for it to start when you have this kind of invitation because he's a good God. Good God. Good Let me ask one other question. How many right now are just kind of dealing with those untamed things in your life? Would you lift your hand too? Good. Good. It might be your, it might be anger. It might be judgment. It, it might be addiction. It might be any of those things. But you're dealing with those right now. Good. Thank you for your courage, your honesty there. What I want to do right now is pray for all of us, myself included, that we come along and we know that our lives are being uh, changed and transformed by God's Holy Spirit. Father, I just want to thank you today for many that have lifted their hands and said, I, I have things that I'm dealing with in my life that are untamed. By the power of Jesus' name, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would fill us, Lord, and give us the strength to overcome as you have through your life, your death, and your resurrection. Lord, I want to thank you for your faithfulness to us, that we've even imagined there are places in our life that you won't come to. You won't go to those dark places, but Lord, you come in to those even dark places that nothing holds you back, that there is nothing that keeps your mercy from us. Your mercy is boundless, and I want to thank you today for that wonderful mercy that you've shown us. 
Lord, thank you for this generous church. Thank you for what you're doing in our community, what you're going to continue to do. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray and we say together, amen and amen.